Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. Wherever you are in life, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how high the problems are, the Holy Spirit has come alongside you to make you adequate to your circumstances. If your circumstances find you in God, you will find God, the Holy Spirit, in your circumstances, making you able to become overcomers. You and I are the dwelling place of God. Fear can sometimes lead us to a life of monotony where we're simply going through the motions. But today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy shares an inspiring lesson on how to break free from fear and live a truly fulfilling life. It's the second part of a message called Fired Up from our Profiles in Courage series. And if you missed part one or any other message from this series, you can replay them online at ktt.org. Now to get us started, here's Pastor Philip. We're in a series, Profiles in Courage. We're challenging ourselves to act like men. Remember Paul said that to the Corinthians? We need to show courage. We need to remain committed to discipleship. We remain committed to biblical theology. We need to speak up and stand up for Christ and having done all to stand in this evil day. And so we've been looking at different profiles in courage, and we're coming this morning to look at Timothy. It's a message I've called Fired Up, and I love that. Here we are on the inside of a new year, and I hope you're fired up. I'm fired up to speak to you on being fired up. I remember reading the description of a person somewhere who had died and was buried, and and the person commenting on their life said about that man, he died at 30 and was buried at 60. You get the point? He was alive, but not alive. He was breathing, but not blossoming. See, guys, this morning, here's what I want you to think about. Death is not the thing to be scared of. The thing to be scared of is not having lived fully, of falling beneath your privileges, of living beneath your potential, of muddling your way through life half speed with little direction. When you and I fall short of the life God planned for us and the life God purposed for us, we are sinning. You can sin actively and you can sin passively. Fear passivity. Fear sluggishness. Fear mediocrity. Let's see some factors, and we'll move quickly here, some factors that will help us to remain fired up. Number one, what I call the encouragement. To remain fired up, guys, we need people in our corner who believe in us as believers. We need encouragers to encourage us, who recognize the genuineness of God's work in us and the greatness of His calling toward us. And such was the case with Paul and Timothy. Our text is going to show us that Paul had a confidence in Timothy. And he strengthened Timothy's confidence. And he pushed him to greater things. Paul was Timothy's mentor, his father in the faith, his encourager, one who stoked the fire. You want to stay fired up? Make sure you've got friends who are friends of God. The right people pouring into us helps us reach our potential. Number two, the endowment, the endowment. To remain fired up, we need to remember that God has equipped us and gifted us for life and ministry and has ordained us to develop that ministry and cultivate that giftedness. Look at verse six again. Therefore, I remind you to stir up, notice the gift of God, which is in you through the means of the laying on of my hands the gift of God which is in you. 
Now, there's a debate among commentators as it relates to the who and the what of this gift. Is it the Holy Spirit Himself? Is He the gift? Is it a ministry gift, a charismata, a spiritual enablement to fulfill a ministry? It's a great debate. I'm not sure you need to die in any one of those hills, but my own conviction would lead me, since we're dealing with the church leader, since we're looking at the second letter of Paul's pastoral epistles to Timothy, that we're probably dealing with a spiritual gift, not the Holy Spirit, but the gifts that the Holy Spirit give. We might be dealing with the gift of leadership. We might be dealing with the, the gift of preaching, teaching, or maybe the gift of evangelism. And in fact, when you get to chapter 4 of this letter, Paul will talk about preach the Word. That's your job. That's your gifting. That's your calling. Do the work of evangelists. That's your calling and, and giftedness also, perhaps. Uh, so, I'll reduce it down to this. My assumption is, whatever form we're talking about, expression we're talking about, we're dealing with an ordination gift that equipped Timothy for future ministry. I think that's where we're at. Timothy, you're the whole package. You were gifted by the Holy Spirit. We recognize your potential at your ordination. We set you apart for Christian ministry. Now, go, go after it. Develop yourself. That's the thought, you know? Don't bury your talent, Timothy. Remember the story Jesus told Timothy about burying talents? leaving stuff underdeveloped. Don't do that. God's never pleased with that. So go find into a flame your spiritual potential. Go to develop yourself to the fullest that you can so that you live a full life. My life's about to end. God willing, your life will continue. Now make it count. Guys, implication Timothy was the whole package, and he needed to keep driving forward and keep developing into something more. And like Timothy, you and I are the whole package. We are born with natural gifts and skills and aptitudes. We've got a lot of potential, every individual one of us, in different areas. We don't all need to be cookie cutter cutouts of, of any one particular person doing any one particular thing. Then we, we get new birth, which loads us down with charismata, gifts, abilities, aptitudes from the Holy Spirit. You're the whole package. But as with gifts, they must be unwrapped. And so must you unwrap your gifts and fan them into a flame. Have you truly discovered yet your sweet spots, your strengths, your abilities, your God-given talents? And having discovered them, are you employing them and developing them? I mean, that's Paul's encouragement to Timothy, isn't it? In 1 Timothy 4, verses 12 to 16, let's just read those words. Let no one despise your youth. Be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity till I come. Look at this. Give attention to reading, exhortation, doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and the doctrine continue in them, for in doing this you will both save yourself and those who hear you. Timothy, progress. Move forward. Do something more. Guys, you're the whole package. Are you unwrapping the package? Are you discovering the gifts? We're to serve the Lord indiscriminately in all kinds of areas, but there are some areas we need to focus our energy and attention and skill on so that we can be our best, doing the best thing we can do for Christ. Gifts may not be a choice, but the discovery of them is a choice, and the development of them 
is a commitment. Guys, you'll discover your potential by studying the subject of spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, by sensing divine desire, Psalm 37, verse 4, by simply serving, for gift makes room for itself, Proverbs 18, 16, by seeking confirmation by godly leaders or mentors in your life, 2 Timothy 1, 6 to 7, and by seeing where you are most fruitful, where your abilities shine, 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. Nick, that a goal for 2023. Just double down on who am I in Christ? What am I in the Spirit? And what must I become more for God's glory? Because see, we're after a full life, not just a long life. We must develop our giftedness, sharpen our skills. King David set apart 288 men for service in the temple through music. And here's what we read of them in 1 Chronicles 25, verse 7. They were trained and skilled in music. Core classes will help you discover some of your giftedness. For those that qualify, our core ministry training track will help you develop your abilities for Christ. Be your best self. For Jesus in 2023, you know my story, so I'm not going to repeat it in any great depth, but you know, in the ministry in Northern Ireland, through a friendship with Dr. John MacArthur, I came out to the Master's Seminary, was exposed to the Master's Seminary and Shepherd's Conference, and saw a level of commitment, saw a pursuit of excellence I hungered for. So much so that I went home and told June, we're packing up. We're leaving our church, we're leaving our country, we're leaving our family, we're leaving our friends because I want to go and be the best that I can be for the Lord Jesus. And I was reinforced by a study of a sermon by Spurgeon speaking to young men in London who were street preachers and didn't think there was any necessity to go to Bible college and learn languages and history and theology. You know, God can hit straight licks with crooked sticks, no doubt. But Spurgeon said, I want to say this, look, God can blow through any ram's horn, but if you can become a silver trumpet, choose that rather. (laughs) Guys, if you can become something more, with a little bit of elbow grease and heart and pursuit of God, choose that rather. Don't go through 2023 at the same level you did in 2022. That would come back to bite you at the judgment seat of Christ. You won't like the thought of that on your deathbed. And you won't want to look into the face of the Son of God who gave everything for us. Let's move on. This is a quicker thought, what I call the endorsement. Still on this idea of his ordination, the laying on of hands by Paul here in 2 Timothy 1 verse 6, and the laying on of hands by the presbytery, the body of elders over a local church in 1 Timothy 4 verse 14. Here's another thought. To remain fired up, we have got to be mindful of the coming judgment and our eternal accountability to God. Say, Pastor, where'd you get that thought? Is it in the text? I think it's by inference. I think it's there. See, this thought comes from the implication of the elders laying hands on Timothy and Paul laying hands on Timothy and, listen, setting him apart for gospel ministry. Because I want to tie that into 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. Because, you see, at ordination services, when people are set apart for gospel ministry, they are given solemn charges. And Paul says about Timothy's ordination, about the charge that was given to him, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, I charge you, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Fulfill your ordination vows. Live up to the potential of the laying of hands ceremony that set you apart for gospel ministry. Timothy, you're accountable to God. Now, you said some solemn things in front of us and before the church, 
but I'm calling God in as a witness, and I'm calling Jesus Christ in as witness, who's coming and his kingdom's coming with him. That's a verse that supports premillennialism, but we'll leave it there. The kingdom's not here, it's coming when Jesus comes. But I'm calling God to witness against you and Jesus Christ to witness against you. Are you being faithful? Will you live up to your potential? Will you develop the giftedness that we recognize that the laying on of hands? So the point is simply this, guys. The backdrop of eternity, the judgment seat of Christ, the evaluation of our stewardship during time, the loss or gain of eternal reward, that should fire us up. <laughs> I mean, if the thought of eternity, living somewhere forever, standing before God to give an account for every word spoken, every minute lived, and every action done, and every thought conceived, that's scary stuff. That stirs the soul of a man who's alive to God and gets you up and stops you muddling through life at half speed without any direction. No, we're headed to the judgment seat of Christ. We're headed to the bema, where our lives will be judged. Did we do what was useful, or were we useless? I mean, this is what fired Paul up. In chapter 4 of this very letter, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. It's a pictorial manner of describing his death. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but all those who love his appearing. Paul ministered. Paul fought temptation. Paul loved God's people. Paul courageously reached the world under the overhang of the coming judgment. He kept them on the straight and narrow, kept them fired up, kept them stirred up about spiritual things. A couple of years back, I read a wonderful book called 50 Christians Every Christian Should Know by Warren Wearsby. And in it, he, he quotes Bishop Lightfoot, a wonderful man of God, part of the Church of England, scholar, pastor, a trainer of men. And one day he's speaking to young pastors, up-and-coming scholars, and he talks about their ordination that's about to happen. Listen to these words in the context of what we've just talked about, Timothy. He says this, man, forget me, forget the ordination service tomorrow, forget the human questioner, transport yourselves and thought from the initial to the final inquiry. The great day of inquisition. The supreme moment of revelation is come. The chief shepherd, the universal bishop of souls, is the questioner. The wilt thou of the ordination day is exchanged for the hast thou of the judgment day. This is a good counsel for all of us, but especially for those who serve as ministers and who want to hear our masters well done. That's powerful. Someday, the have you will become hast you. Will you and I have lived up to our potential? The wilt thou of our ordination will be exchanged for the hast thou of the judgment. All right, keep moving. The empowerment. The empowerment. Here's another thing, if you've been keeping track. To remain fired up, we can rely on the infused power of the Holy Spirit to stay in foods. You know, how do you keep going? How do you sustain this commitment to excellence and the pursuit of God and, and realizing your potential? Well, thankfully, you don't do it by yourself. You're not alone. You have assistance. You've got human assistance. You've got men like Paul in your life encouraging you and pointing you in the right direction and patting you on the back and all of that. But you've got divine assistance. You have the indwelling power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Fear, trepidation, 
withdrawal, holding back, behaving weakly is not from God. If that's where you and I are at at any point in our life, faithlessness on our part has created that spirit. Giving in to the temptations of the devil has created that spirit. Listening to the world or giving into its pressure has created that spirit of fear. God didn't create that. The Holy Spirit doesn't produce that. God has not given us a attitude, spirit of fear, trepidation, or withdrawal. No, God has given us power. Love that. An attitude of fear, a spirit of cowardliness is antithetical to Christianity, given the power of the Holy Spirit that has been bequeathed to us and given to the church. Verse 7 of 2 Timothy 1, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. Acts 1 verse 8, the Spirit of God is described as power that will come upon us so we may be God's witnesses. Remember when Jesus promised his disciples that I'm going to go, but if I go, the Spirit will come, the Comforter, who is now with you, but in that day will be in you. We're talking about a dispensational transition from old covenant to new covenant, where the Spirit of God is no longer on us and with us, but actually in us. There's an inwardness and a permanence to the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament believer. Aren't you glad you're living post-New Testament, post-Pentecost, where you and I have the company of the Comforter wherever we go? And that was given in the context of troubled hearts. John 14, verse 1, John 14, 14 to 16. You know the word Comforter means paraclete. It's a Greek word made up of two words. It's a compound term, to come alongside, to strengthen. Isn't that beautiful? That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's who the Holy Spirit is. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do for every man in this room and sanctuary this morning. Wherever you are in life, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how high the problems are, the Holy Spirit has come alongside you to make you adequate to your circumstances. If your circumstances find you in God, you will find God, the Holy Spirit, in your circumstances, making you able to become overcomers. You and I are the dwelling place of God. And when God comes into a life, fear goes out. When God comes in, fear goes out. You're listening to Philip DeCourcy here on Know the Truth. And if you've missed any part of today's message, it's titled Fired Up. Replay it and share it online at ktt.org. Today's message is from Philip's Profiles in Courage series, where we're learning how to cultivate courage in a godless society. It's our hope that these studies will empower you to live a life that's bold and anchored in God's Word. And that's why each day on Know the Truth, we boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel through the radio and Internet. But Know the Truth is a listener-funded ministry, and that means your financial gifts help cover the cost of providing Know the Truth to listeners all over the world. So, would you consider giving today? You can call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And when you do, we'll send you a powerful book that unveils the key to conquering fear and finding true biblical courage. It's called Courage, Fighting Fear with Fear. And this book will teach you how to have true courage by fearing God and placing unwavering trust in Him alone. Request a copy for yourself or a friend by calling 888-644-8811 or give your gift online at ktt.org. Well, I'm Wayne Shepherd. Join us tomorrow when Pastor Philip concludes today's message called Fired Up. That's Wednesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.